678. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here together this evening, thankful for this opportunity to approach your throne in prayer. Mindful of these songs that we have sung so far this evening, we're thankful for the message that each one has for us, that we do have a hope of heaven and the comfort of having our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in your presence in our life. We pray, dear God, that we would always look to you to lead us through this life and to eventually lead us home. We pray, Lord, that as we have heard discussed this morning, that you would help each of us to stay on the straight and narrow path, that you would help us to live lives that would be pleasing to you and lives that would help us to hold on to the hope of heaven that we have grateful this evening dear God to come together and have another opportunity to study a portion of your word thankful for brother Sidney as he will stand before us we pray that we would glean much from this lesson that we can put to work in our lives that we can be a shining light for the world around us thank you for this congregation and its leadership thank you for all of the good works that are taking place through it thankful for our young people and the opportunities that they were having, they'll have for learning and studying and going about doing good in your kingdom. Thankful for all the Bible teachers and for the students who listen attentively and try to learn and become more pleasing to you. Thankful, dear God, for all who are part of that, part of this work. We're mindful of those who have been sick physically 
And we certainly remember those who are sick spiritually, dear God, and pray your blessings upon them all. Bless us as we continue in our worship this evening, and it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Number 456. 456. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, sorrow. number 256 we're saying this as an invitation hymn after the lesson this evening 256 stand and turn number 590 590 we're saying the first and third verse of this song 590 
Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're going to read a portion of the latter portion of this chapter, beginning with verse 38, and then a few verses on into chapter 20 as a basis for our study together this evening. John chapter 19. We're going to begin reading with verse 38, of course. If you look back just prior to that, you have the record of the crucifixion of our Lord. And these events then follow that. <clears throat> verse 38, John chapter 19, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. <clears throat> and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. <clears throat> the first day of the week cometh Mary, Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, Yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the, the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. The empty tomb, <clears throat> the place where Jesus had been laid, is now empty. Our Lord has been raised from the dead. According to Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, the ultimate proof of the sonship of Christ. He was declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That empty tomb. That tomb, that empty tomb stands as a challenge to an unbelieving world. How is it to be explained? The child of God, those of us who study the Scriptures, who understand and believe the Scriptures, know it to be the empty tomb that was left by the Son of God. But the unbelieving world has to answer relative to that, un that, uh, that empty tomb. And, and it can't be ignored. It's not something that can be denied Take again your Bibles and turn to Matthew's account of these events in <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 62, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night 
and steal him away. <clears throat> and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last era shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Can't be denied, can it? That the sepulchre where Jesus was, was protected by those who wanted to make sure <clears throat> that that tomb was never empty. They were not able to succeed. How does an unbelieving world explain that? It was empty simply because there had been a resurrection. Just as Jesus had said there would be <clears throat> to some people, that empty tomb and the suggestion of a resurrection is a point of trouble. You'll recall in Acts chapter 4, the first two or three verses of that chapter, at the preaching of Peter and the others concerning the resurrection, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, were disturbed. They wanted to put to silence those who would speak concerning a resurrection. They didn't believe in it. To those people, the empty tomb is a trouble. To others, of course, that empty tomb is a hope and blessed assurance that one day we too, when we pass from this life and we're placed in a grave, will one day be raised from that grave. The lengthy discourse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about that. That if Christ be not raised, then there are a lot of consequences involved and, and one of the consequences is that neither will we ever be raised. But the empty tomb says to us, there is hope. There is going to be a resurrection. There is that blessed assurance that we will be with God one of these days. The tomb where the stone had been taken away serves as that encouragement to us to live in anticipation of that resurrection one of these days. This is the tomb which the disciples looked in and and saw the clothes. This is the tomb where the angel said, He is not here, He is risen. But that tomb is a challenge. Tonight I want us to think about at least three challenges that that empty tomb raises to you and to me and the world around us that may not believe as we believe. That, that empty tomb is a challenge to investigate. Investigate. Has it ever occurred to you, have you ever thought about the idea <clears throat> that God has never feared investigation? Oh, we're familiar with investigations, aren't we? Every time we turn around, it seems like somebody within our government somewhere is being investigated because of the suspected wrongdoing on their part. And it's somewhat of a fearful thing to, to think about the fact that, that we're about to be investigated for, for some reason or another. So we're familiar with the idea of, of an investigation. But you'll notice in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 28 and in verse 6, He is not here, for He is risen, as He said. Come see the place. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Investigate. Check it out for yourselves. See that it's empty now. Where in the days, a day or two ahead, it were, or before that, it was filled. But there's never been a fear on God's part of investigation. Back in Exodus chapter 3, whenever God was appearing to Moses, God had, had heard the cry of His people, and He specifies that within, within this particular context. He says, I, I've, I've seen the affliction. This is down in uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. <clears throat> he said to the Lord, said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for 
I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God says to Moses, I'm going to send you back. I'm going to let you lead those people out from under that oppression and they will be able to go into a land that flows with milk and honey, a good land, a large land. That was God's promise. You'll recall later on after those uh, Israelites had been led out of Egyptian bondage, they had come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. That's the place, you'll recall, where God instructed Moses to send a man out of each of the 12 tribes to go into that land and to espy or check out the land. See what kind of land it is. See what kind of inhabitants are there. See what kind of fruits are in the land. In other words, you go in and you investigate. You check out the land that God says flows with milk and honey, a good and a large land. Was God afraid for those spies to go into that land and investigate? Absolutely not. Because it was a land exactly like God said that it was. And you'll recall they even brought back the fruit to verify that it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. He was not afraid of that investigation. In Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, Jesus said to those disciples on that occasion, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The word learn there is pretty much the same idea as the word investigate. Basically, Jesus is saying to those of that day, you investigate me. You see if, what I, if I am what I claim to be. Now, you remember all of the claims that Jesus made during his earthly ministry. Especially the fact that he was the son of God. If you are laboring and you're heavy laden, you come unto me. You learn of me. Investigate. I have something to offer. That same message is available to us tonight, isn't it? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I dare say you could not find an individual who has ever taken God at his word who would deny what God says about himself, what Jesus says about himself. Investigate. That's what that empty tomb is. It's a challenge to, to investigate. You'll recall in Acts chapter 17, of those folks in Berea, it is said that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that they searched the scriptures with readiness of mind, whether or not those things were so that were being taught. What were they doing? They were investigating. God calls upon us to investigate. That's what that empty tomb says to the world tonight. Investigate God. Investigate that empty tomb. Find out what it's all about. Find out the significance of it and what it means to an unbelieving world. But not only is it a, a challenge to investigate in a general way, it is a challenge to investigate in a very personal way. You know, we can, we can receive help from one another. We can receive help from other people. And, and we can be thankful for that. 
but we cannot substitute for our own investigation. Look into the book of Luke <clears throat> briefly in chapter 24. Yes, uh, Luke chapter 24 and beginning in verse uh, 13. <clears throat> and this again is right after the incident of the empty tomb that we're talking about. Behold, two of them, and this, this is a reference to those disciples who had, had gone to the tomb and, and they had found it empty. Uh, they went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, and, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these, that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, uh, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and, and all the people, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Beside all this today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher when they found not his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. You see, here are some, a couple of fellows walking along and they're discussing all the events of, of the, the arrests, the, the trials, the crucifixion of our Lord, the idea of the empty tomb, and all they're going on for the most part concerning the resurrection as a report. They didn't investigate for themselves. They said certain of our company have checked it out. And they tell us that this is the way it is. They didn't investigate for themselves. They should have. They would have known then beyond a shadow of a doubt that the tomb was empty. It had been secured, remember. Now it's empty. They needed to have investigated that. They had only heard the reports we would suggest to an unbelieving world tonight, to individuals who really do not believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, why don't you investigate the empty tomb and see where it will lead you? It will lead you to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. But not only is that empty tomb a challenge to investigate, it is also a challenge to human devices. It's a challenge to human devices. Notice again in Matthew chapter 27, and we're not going to take the time to, to read all of those verses again, but you recall in verses 64 through 66, the plea to Pilate was, make that tomb sure. You know what he said? Three days, I'm going to be raised. And if we don't do something to make that tomb sure, his disciples are going to come along. They're going to take away the body. They're going to hide it. After all, they're a pretty deceitful bunch of people, aren't they? That's what they would have you believe. And so you make it as sure as you can. What did Pilate say? Yeah, you go. You've got to watch. That, that's under your control. You do what you can to make sure that he doesn't come out of that grave in the first three days. That's what they did. Human devices. 
What happened on the third day? In spite of all of the human devices to make sure it didn't happen, what happened? Our Lord came forth from that grave. That simply says to a world that would investigate and accept the challenge that the empty tomb is the answer to human devices. Think about that in connection with John 1.11. Jesus had been prophesied, his coming had been prophesied six, seven, eight hundred years before it actually came to pass. That he was coming and and there are over 300 prophecies, minute prophecies, of the coming of Christ, of His birth, of His life, of His death, burial, and resurrection. Probably Isaiah 53 being one of the more notable ones concerning His death. All of these prophecies were given. But when He came into His own, John 1.11, his own received him not. And it is unbelievable how the premillennialists have jumped on that verse. The Jews rejected the one who had come to establish the kingdom here on this earth. And because of their rejection, it was postponed. And now, you know, you know all that premillennial stuff. But you know what? In spite of human devices, in spite of the rejection of the Jews themselves, God's plan went full force ahead. And so when you read in Colossians chapter 1, concerning those saints and faithful brethren in Colossae, they've been translated into the kingdom. Oh, I thought it was thwarted. I thought God's plan wasn't carried out because of the rejection of the Jews. Wrong. The kingdom was set up just exactly like God intended to set it up. And now Christ is reigning. What was it Peter said on that first Pentecost? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the ruler. What is he ruling over if not his own kingdom? The empty tomb is a challenge to the devices of men. There is no way that God is going to allow mankind to thwart his plan and his purpose here on this earth. You see the soldiers at that tomb were as helpless as infants when it was time for our Lord to come forth out of that grave. The devices of men could not thwart the plan of God. Now, if you want to look at that further, just think about it for a minute. Whenever God decided to bring Israel out of Egypt, Pharaoh did everything within his power. And Egypt was a mighty, mighty nation at that time. He did everything within his power to keep those people there under his control to be his servants. What did God do? Parted the mighty waters of the Red Sea. That those people could walk across on dry ground and then drown the Egyptian army in those same waters. That's the God of power that the world is fighting against tonight. And it's a useless battle. They're not going to win. In the same vein, when they came to the Jordan, what happened? Same thing. When they got into the land of Canaan itself, you look in uh, uh, Numbers chapter 16, and you'll find God's power. Why, even the earth opened up on one occasion, didn't it, and swallowed up a bunch of folks who were rebellious. The empty tomb is a challenge to the devices of men 
that will not win. So the empty tomb that you read about is a challenge to investigate. It's a challenge to human devices. But a third thing that I want to mention in that regard is that the empty tomb is a challenge to useless anxiety. Now, if you can't relate to the other two, I just would suspect you can relate to this one. When you go back and you read, look, for example, in, in Mark's account of things. In Mark uh, chapter 16, when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, who shall, roll away, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? What were they worried about? Well, we've bought these spices. Our desire is to, to anoint the body of, of Jesus, but we've got a problem. Who's going to roll the stone away for us? Something to be concerned about? Well, from a human standpoint, indeed, that was something to be worried about. But then you come right on down to verse 4, and when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. What were they worried about? Something that they didn't need to be worried about. Something that had already been taken care of before they ever got there. The stone was moved already. They were doing what they could, and God took care of the rest. How often have we talked about matters of worry and anxiety and how for the most part much of what we worry about will never happen or it's something about which we can do nothing anyway so we waste all of that unnecessary energy in worry and anxiety about those kinds of things. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, that Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 25, Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Then he gives some illustrations. He talks about the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things that the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the days the evil thereof. Now, now Jesus is not telling us not to make any plans for the future. Don't misunderstand what he's saying. But he's simply saying to us that we have enough to deal with today. Deal with it. Tomorrow will take care of itself as we do that. I remember, this may be a minor point to some of you, but, but I remember the first day of class at Memphis School of Preaching in 1968. Stephen maybe can relate to this. We met all of our classes and we got our assignments for the quarter. And I told Ann, I said, I might as well go home. There's no way I can do all of that in 10 weeks. No way. One of the first things they wanted us to do was write a commentary on Matthew. I thought, whoa. <laughs> you know, plus about 250, 300 verses to memorize and a few other little sidelights along the way. There, there's no way. But I backed up and I took one day at a time. Did what I could each day. Would you believe by the end of the quarter I had it all done? There's no need to sit back and worry about it. Just take care of today and then when the time comes...
Tomorrow will take care of itself. That's what the empty tomb says to you and to me tonight. We do what we can do and God will take care of the rest. That is, if we are faithfully following and serving Him, we worry about a lot of unnecessary things. You know, there's some verses that speak to this. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, this is a section where Paul was writing to Timothy about riches and the danger of riches and so forth. He simply says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness and contentment. Is there anything more difficult in life with which we have to deal than learning to be content? I don't know what it would be. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul said of himself, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now that's not easy, is it? Because we're not always dealt the best in life. Life can throw some pretty rough bumps at us at times. But in whatever state, be content. Why? Because God is with us if we're serving Him faithfully. And probably summing up all of that is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. In which verses 5 and 6 in which the Hebrews writer said concerning that very point. God has promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper I will not fear what men shall do to me. What was it Paul said in writing to the Romans? If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, and there's so many other verses. But here these two were, three were concerned about who's going to roll away the stone. And it's already been rolled away. Useless anxiety message and a challenge of that empty tomb and so when you think about that the resurrection of our Lord that empty sepulcher the stone being rolled away he's not here he's risen think about that empty tomb it's a challenge to investigate investigate God Investigate that empty tomb and the significance of it. It's a challenge to investigate. It is a challenge against human devices. Everything that man tries combined will never thwart the plan of God. Never. It may seem at times that things are not going as well far as as they ought to go because of the opposition from the outside world. But God is not going to allow His plan to end because of the devices of men. And it's a challenge to us to think about the things that we worry about, the things we become anxious about. Be content with today. Make the best with God's help of, of today. And then if tomorrow comes, we'll do the same again. Don't borrow trouble. And that's really what Matthew 6:34 is saying. Sufficient unto the day. You gotta have enough problems today. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. It's a good lesson for us, I think, in our Christian lives. The challenge of the empty tomb. That empty tomb says that there's a risen Savior. We sing that song, I serve a risen Savior. But it could be tonight that you're in this audience and you don't serve that risen Savior. That empty tomb means nothing to you at this point. The fact that Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day, that you could enjoy forgiveness of sins, fellowship with God, the hope of everlasting life, and tonight you don't enjoy any of that. What does the empty tomb say to you? It's a challenge to you to accept the benefits of the risen Savior through your obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
allowing your faith to lead you away from sin and confess that faith, lead you into that watery grave where you can be baptized. Have the guilt of sin washed away, raised to walk a new life. So we talked this morning down that narrow way that leads to life. That's the challenge of the empty tomb to you tonight. As a child of God who may have wandered away from that narrow way that leads to life, that empty tomb says to you there's a risen Savior. And one day he's going to serve as your judge. What's the empty tomb going to mean to you then? What does it mean to you tonight? Would you ask God's forgiveness? Would you confess your wrongdoings? Be restored to that fellowship with God? If the challenge of the empty tomb means anything to you tonight, concerning which you need to respond to the Lord's invitation in a public way, we encourage you to do it now as we stand together and sing this song selected. All those that had a public part in our worship, we're so thankful for your efforts, especially Sidney with his fine lessons today, Brother Johnny leading our singing this morning, Martin this evening, and all others who did have a public part. For those that are here tonight that were not this morning, we'd ask you to please fill out an attendance card, leave that on the table, or give to us as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit with us. Do we have any that we need to add to the prayer list? Glad to see each of those that have been struggling with some health difficulties back with us. Next Saturday, this coming Saturday, December the 4th, is the holiday party here at the building. It is a potluck. We will not have another potluck for kicking off the winter quarter, which is the next day. We'll just have one event, which will be this coming Saturday here at the building. What time does that start? Five o'clock, five o'clock this coming Saturday is the holiday party potluck here at the building. We look forward to seeing each of you at that time. Again, next Sunday is the beginning of our winter quarter. Now, 
the existing quarter goes through this Wednesday night. So those that still have teaching responsibilities for this quarter, please fulfill those for this coming Wednesday night. But the beginning of the winter quarter begins next Sunday, December the 5th. Did you have something? Okay. I thought you were waving at me. <laughs> Brothers Keepers Group 1, the uh, project that we had announced for those that are participating in that is due December the 8th. Please have that back to Chris and Stephanie Hodges. Brothers Keepers Group 1 will meet uh, Saturday, December the 11th uh, at the home of Richard and Shirley at 6.30. That's Saturday week. Also, Group 4 meets at the home of Johnny and Melanie McDaniel Saturday week, December the 11th, 5.30. Brothers Keepers Group 3 will meet next Sunday after the evening services at the home of Brian and Rachel Wheeler. Bring, bring finger foods, also bring your fruit for the fruit basket project. Again, Brothers Keepers Group 3 meets next Sunday after the evening service at the home of Brian and Rachel Wheeler. Also, for those of you that were not familiar with this, today is Ann White's birthday. Now... We actually didn't sing to her here, but we did sing to her at Cracker Barrel, so she was eligible for that. Oh, well, well, she's... <laughs> I better not announce that. I don't know specifically, <laughs> but I know that she's not eligible to be sung to here at this congregation just yet. So congratulations. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. It's in the library. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left. There will be some of there waiting to serve you. Next service, Wednesday at 7. We hope to see each of you at that time. Should we mention anything else? Just a reminder, for the benefit of the elders, deacons, and uh, the uh, elders, deacons, end of the year okay. meal is Thursday, December the 30th. That's in this week's bulletin uh, for elders, their wives, deacon, and their wives. Uh, there is an, and this is an area-wide event, there'll be several others from other congregations, but we're hosting it here at the building, and it is uh, Thursday, December the 30th, and that will be a catered event, right? That will be a catered event, but that is in this uh, week's bulletin, and we'll ask that continue to be in the bulletin upcoming so that we'll make sure that we're aware of that. Anything else? Final song. 429. 429 is our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Let's pray. Dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for Sydney and Ann, for the leadership in the church. Also, dear Lord, pray for our elders that continue to lead the church in the right way and do the right things to keep us going forward. Also, dear Lord, pray for Johnny as he continues to lead our young people. Dear Lord, please be with us and until we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.